So we've got Stephen coming on in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, we actually have your book, and we have a dog with uh, hemogeosarcoma, and we've been doing the pup loaf and other things. I noticed in your last thing you said to cut the butternut squash in half. Is there anything else you would change in that recipe for the pup loaf? No, and you know what? Even for a hemangio dog, we've had tons of them fed without even cutting the um, the uh, butternut squash, um, and they do just fine uh, for the hemangio. So I'm not that concerned with it. Uh, hers is a young dog with mast cell, and so I'm, I want to cut the sugar a little bit more on that dog. Okay, we've cut all the carbs. So the other yep. question is, what are you losing by cooking the food as opposed to feeding the raw? Because we haven't done raw. We've just done the cooked stuff. You're really not. I mean, there's a lot of people, the, 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 the raw feeding people get a little crazy if you mention ever cooking something. So you, you'll get uh, all kinds of backlash on social media. Uh, but really, you're, some things are actually releasing more nutrients, like the, the veggies are releasing more nutrients when they are cooked. Uh, and you're really, especially if you're lightly cooking, you're not losing anything with your meats. Um, some of the, the, the natural enzymes, like the digestive enzymes, you might lose that a little bit, but you can replace that with a digestive enzyme powder. So it's really not significant that it would, you know, they're getting great nutrition with the gently cooked, just like, I, I just don't want to see you uh, burning it to a briquette. Uh, so gently cooked means it's okay if there's no red left, but that's about it. Yeah. 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 So medium, medium, rare, rare, you know, down there. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, Sarah Gold wants to know, is pup loaf good for my nine-week-old pup who's two and a half pounds and a 14-year-old dog? So for the 14-year-old dog, absolutely fine. For puppies, I don't generally recommend uh, homemade because of the uh, calcium requirements for those guys being a little different. Uh, so um, you could either get a gently cooked or a pre-made raw uh, that is specifically labeled for all uh, life stages. Okay, Keith, looks like you're up. Um, can you hear me okay, Dr. Morgan? I can. Okay. Um, I have a dog that has problems with reflux. He's three years old now, and we're using a pre-made uh, fermented uh, dog food in addition to their goat's milk. Uh, we've added in ginger uh, to his meals. Um, occasionally we use like a commercial product that has slippery elm and some other additives to it. Um, but we're still occasionally having problems with reflux, just a little burp, licking lips, that sort of thing. I was going to see if there's anything else. Um, and then I guess also the question is the product we're using for his food is about 14% protein, 14% fat. And if the higher fat content is making the reflux worse. What breeds the dog? Uh, caisson. Um, do you, are you rotating proteins? Yes. So what I would do, I would try the company that you're using. Do they have, how many protein choices do they have? Uh, four or five. It's answers. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I know five. what they have. Uh, so they've got, uh, beef, turkey, chicken, pork, and I believe duck now. Um, That's correct. So, uh, what I would do is pick just one and stick with it for about 10 days and okay. keep a journal of the reflux. Then pick another one, stick with it for 10 days, keep a journal of the reflux. See if one of them is setting this off. Um, how often do you rotate your proteins now? Is it just whatever you pull out? It's about every six days. That's about how long it takes him to go through one. Okay, yeah, I, I would uh, keep track. Uh, do, do something, so if you're, if you're on one for six days, go for 12 keep track in a little journal and try each protein individually and see if we can pinpoint it down uh, to one or two that might be more problematic for this child. Um, we occasionally get a dog that doesn't do well on fermented food. I love their products, so I'm not going to say anything bad about it because I recommend it for a ton of animals. Um, the other thing, uh, and we would have to investigate it a lot further, um, it would be to figure out, is there a constitutional problem that maybe we need a, a more specific, specifically targeted herb? So what I would say first okay. is do your little food journal, keeping track of the different proteins. Um, and let's see what that 
tells you, if it doesn't tell you anything at all, then we're, we should go back and look at the constitution of the animal, which in which case I would say, email me and we'll get some more information and we can try to hone it down and then pick. Cause there's so many different herbs that we could try um, that without really doing a deep dive, I can't tell you. I mean, it could be that we need to warm the GI tract. It could be, we need to cool the GI tract. Uh, it could be that we've got a little food stagnation in there and we need to move things through a little more quickly. So that would be a, a, a deeper dive. But first I would start with a food journal. Is, is the higher fat a problem, say a diet that's 14% fat instead of like 5%? Because I mentioned it to our um, veterinarian who also does nutrition. Um, and she said, well, we may have to have him in and do a custom diet, do a lower fat diet. So is feeding him a higher fat diet, does it decrease the gastric emptying and more reflux, Not necessarily. that sort of thing? Or? Not necessarily. Yeah. And, and again, that's an individual thing. So one of our dogs absolutely cannot eat that diet. It, the fat just, she can't do it. Um, and that's an individual thing. So the other thing you could do is you could try a lower fat diet. You could try a different company. You could try something like, you know, mm -hmm. all provide. I mean, the answers is known for their high fat because they're getting more toward keto right. with their diets. And that's great. Uh, but you could try a primal or a Stella's or an all provide, which has a lower fat and see if that makes the problem go away. If it does, yay. Okay. You know, so it's, it's trial okay. and error a little bit. Um, and then kind of go from there. Okay. Having added the having added the ginger in seems like it helps. It helps. Okay, um, so that is a warming also, herb. Um, that's a, that's a warming yeah. herb. The uh, slippery elm is a little more cooling. So that would mm -hmm. be another thing to try to decipher with your journal which one helps more. So okay. do a week with just ginger. Do a week with just slippery elm. See which is better. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll see if there's anything else. Um, okay. Well, that sounds fun. And then also I was thinking the ants are a little hot, more calorie dense, and we're feeding less, probably six or eight ounces a day less, that that wasn't filling right. his stomach up and maybe less reflux also. So maybe that was helping. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> so I did, I did see your written question in there. Is that what we want to talk about? Um, yeah, I asked also, um, I know you mentioned getting commercial brand for the puppy. Mm -hmm. I think that's so that I don't miss any vital nutrients because, yes, yes. Correct? Yeah, because during those, so before six months of age, we've got the rapid growth phase. We want to make sure that our calcium phosphorus balance is absolutely perfect. We can kind of guess the pup loaf was formulated to adult standards. Um, I, I did not formulate that for that rapid growth phase. So generally I recommend that you, if are you feeding your uh, dogs raw or cooked or kibble? I'm feeding my, the, my older dog cooked for, okay. for many years now. I was just wondering now that I have this new puppy, what should I, can, can I, can I eventually transition her to? Yeah. You'd be able to feed them both pup loaf after six months. After six months. Do you recommend a certain dog food for her at this two and a half pound, nine week, situation uh, i've never had I a dog do, i do know that all provide makes a puppy formula it is raw but you could gently cook it you can order it off their website allprovide.com i do believe that the answers foods are formulated for all life stages and that's really and there's some honest kitchen uh, some of their which is a dehydrated or freeze dried um some of their formulations are appropriate for all life stages. So that's what you want to look at. If you go to a website, you want to see, it'll say in the description, formulated for all life stages, formulated for seniors, formulated for puppies, formulated for large breed uh, puppies, because that's a whole different category. Right. Um, so that's what you want to look for. And that's what I recommend for that first six months. And then if you want to transition and feed them both the same thing, uh, the pup loaf works well for almost all life stages. Now your 14 year old might start getting into some issues with kidney problems or heart problems in the next few years. And, you know, then you, we might have to change things a little bit for that particular dog. Uh, but I've had dogs that have eaten pup loaf for, geez, you know, till they're 16, 17, 18 and do just fine. So, okay. She said that. She said if it, it, it might have to change his diet. But for right now, okay. So 
Allprovide.com or Honest Kitchen are good brands for. Those would both be fine. You could check out Answers, but Answers you would have to feed raw. Uh, I don't recommend cooking their food uh, because it's such a high fat, but it's great. Is it okay to give a puppy raw? Oh, absolutely. Young? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Judy Morgan. Can you can you hear me? It looks like I need to be on Chrome to share a video, but okay, I, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, I just have one quick question. Okay. Um, I have well, there he is. I have a, a geriatric old English bulldog. He has a history of several surgeries. Um, we actually met you when you were in Atlanta, I think, last year. Okay. Um, but we have your uh, senior deer antler velvet. Um, product and i wanted to know because i read a little bit of i don't know enough about deer antler velvet but i did read something that kind of spooked me about it and um it just the, the, about the um growth factors is it possible that that would encourage tumor growth if he's already maybe down that path and since he's so old is that something that you've ever seen yeah no issue? that's that that's not um not a problem not a problem okay Okay. Yeah, because I've seen that it's you know actually encouraged for cancer, and um, but then other places just the the growth factor kind of scares me. But um, yeah, no, no, it's know. absolutely fine because uh, it's so good for the immune system and it's so good for decreasing inflammation, which is what we're trying to do with cancers. Okay. Okay. So I will not worry about that. <laughs> okay. All right. That's that's my only question. Thank you. You're welcome. So her dog got one of my dogs answering. <laughs> um, so Amy, there seems to be people wanting to come on, but for some reason their um, their um, screens do don't switch on, so we can't actually see the video. Um, so those of you that have tried to link up to the video but haven't get, got through, can you send me your questions? Um, there was um, a couple of questions that I got regarding um, allergies again. That seems to be a topic that a lot of people want to know more about. Um, they were asking about um, what's the best what's the best diet for um, pets that have got or dogs in particular that have environmental allergies. What foods would help them? And there's also um, they've also asked about supplements. Okay, so. Dogs with allergies, whether it's environmental or food, whatever, uh, it really, it boils down to a couple of things. One, it boils down to genetics. So if you happen to have a breed that is prone to allergies, German Shepherds, West Highland White Terriers, a lot of Shih Tzus, um, you, you were, we have a hard time fighting the genetics. So for those guys doing allergy testing, whether you do skin testing or blood testing, and then using desensitization is a really good idea. Allergies are an inflammatory problem. It's an inflammatory process, which from a Chinese medicine standpoint, we talk about whether things are hot or cold. That is a hot problem. It's a bunch of inflammation. They turn red, they get infected, they get stinky, their skin is hot. So that's all hot problems. From a diet perspective, we want to cool down the body. So everything that we eat, everything that we feed is either going to add heat. So think about eating um, a hot, spicy curry. Your tongue gets burning, you feel the burn all the way down, you start sweating, that's hot. That's adding heat internally. You wanna cool off, you eat ice cream, you eat watermelon. So everything that we put in our body is going to have an effect, whether it's going to warm or cool. If we have a hot problem going on in the body, we've got to cool things down. So in order to cool things down, we look for cooling proteins. Well, one of the best cooling proteins is rabbit, which also happens to be a pretty novel protein for almost all dogs. So getting to a nice, clean diet, and we've got to get away from kibble. Kibble is hot and dry. So we want to have a high moisture diet. Now, rabbit can be very difficult to source um, and it can be very expensive. So a couple of other options that will work. Duck, also hard to source. Um, it can be a little high fat for some animals versus the rabbit, which is a much leaner meat. Pork is our third option uh, or cold water fish. Uh, so I take a lot of these dogs who are just having allergies to everything and in 
you know, looking at how can we make this reasonably priced. A lot of times we'll go to a, a pork tenderloin diet that's gently cooked, or we'll go to a white fish diet that is um, gently cooked. There are commercial diets out there that you can use. Uh, there are some uh, raw food companies that make very nice rabbit based products. Uh, there are some that make some uh, white fish based products that I like as well. We want to have the diet as clean as possible. So you want to have things human grade. You don't want to be feeding bottom of the barrel stuff. We don't want to feed uh, things that have a million ingredients in them. When you're looking at that ingredient list, you want it to be pretty darn short. Uh, sometimes I'll take these animals and I'll put them on a six month, very limited ingredient diet. Answers Pet Food has an elimination diet protocol. We had a 115 pound German Shepherd that we put on a goat milk fast for 30 days and all he ate for 30 days. And this is a lot of goat milk for a 115 pound dog. He was drinking all day long. Uh, but within 30 days, that dog's allergies were gone. And uh, then we put him on a pork based limited ingredient diet to get him back on whole foods. And his allergies came back about 5%. We went from 100% to 5%. That's pretty darn good. And that was without doing any allergy desensitization, without adding in any medications. We can also add herbs. There's a lot of things that we can do for these guys. Um, blood allergy tests says allergic to all proteins. That is not. It's not, I, I got an email once from somebody who said, what do I feed my dog if he can't eat protein? Well, that's not a possibility. And vegetarian diets are really bad for dogs and horrible for cats. Um, so you really don't wanna go there. And uh, it's really about finding a, a clean protein, not a kibble-based protein, not something that's uh, got a lot of ingredients in there. If you're looking for natural anti-inflammatories, licorice herbal licorice is great you can also buy plant sterols easy to find um plant sterols are sort of the plant substitute for steroids without the side effects of steroids so there's a lot of anti-inflammatory things that we can use um for dogs that are really broken out their skin is bad there's a grooming um process called theraclean if you can find a groomer that has a theraclean system they're about 12 to fifteen thousand dollars so not that many groomers have them i think there's three now in new jersey uh was two and i think we have a third one now um there's a couple in the philadelphia area but if you go to theraclean uh website i think it's thera-clean.com maybe. Uh, if you go to their website, uh, if you can find a groomer that does that and you take these dogs, it doesn't use any soaps or detergents. You take these dogs, get a TheraClean bath once or twice a week for a few weeks. It will help immensely. And you got to get all that stuff off their coat. For these dogs that have environmental allergies, every time they go outside and come in, you've got to wipe them down, get just with a damp cloth, but get all that pollen off of them. Very annoying for them. Um, be very careful with what you're using to clean your floors, what you're washing your sheets in if they're sleeping in your bed, what you're washing their beds with, what kind of cleaning products you're using. Everything has to be all natural for these guys. Apple cider vinegar diluted is one of the best cleansers. You can use that between their toes to wipe down their feet. Um, you've got to keep these guys a little bit bubble wrapped, which means keeping the pollens off of them. But a lot of it is inhaled. So if you're one of those people like me, you like to have all your windows open on a nice spring day and the pollens are coating your car, well, you're doing your pet a disservice and causing a problem for them as much as we all love that. Uh, these guys can't take it because they're breathing that in. And if you have pets who have, um, and I'm a big fan of allergy desensitization with either the um, the the shots that are made specifically for each dog or the sublingual drops that they've made it easy now. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. We do it a lot and it uh, does help a lot. Hope that helps. <laughs> I lost my moderator. 
nope, there's um, no, I'm still here. I was trying to get um, someone else on, but it's it's the same things happened again. Oh, um, there was another <laughs> there was another question about intermittent fasting and whether you think it's good for dogs. And the other part was, are there any dogs that you wouldn't consider intermittent fasting for? <laughs> well, uh, so I answered this one on, um, I think it was on my supporters the other night. Um, uh, so intermittent fasting is good for all of us because what it does when you fast is you, it puts you more into utilizing, it puts you in a state of ketosis. Basically it makes you utilize ketones more than sugar. Uh, which is a, a great state for us to be in. The lower our blood sugar is, like we should all, all, us, our pets, we should all be running around with blood sugars of 60 to 70. Most of us are running around with blood sugars of 120, which is not really that healthy. It's more inflammatory for our body. Does intermittent fasting tend to get you more to that state? Yes. Would my dogs put up with fasting once a week? Oh my gosh, I would have to leave the house for that 24 <laughs> hours because it's just not going to happen. Um, so you can do things like you could feed them their dinner or if you feed twice a day, you could feed them dinner early at like four and then maybe not give them breakfast till noon the next day and maybe give them a light meal or a snack just to keep that blood sugar down a little bit. But for those who feed raw diets, you will find that your dog's blood sugars stay much lower than those who are feeding diets that are high in carbohydrates. I think Rodney Habib took his own dog. I can't believe he did it with his own dog because he's a raw feeder. And he tested the dog's blood sugar on its raw food and it was running at you know, 70, 75. And then he fed a couple kibble meals and it went up 40 points. So that's how quickly the change occurs. Um, so fasting intermittently, yeah, it, it's a wonderful thing. I don't do it with my dogs. I would not do it with a diabetic dog because we've got to, you know, we've got to be giving insulin. We've got to keep those guys at a pretty steady state. So there are certainly some animals where it would not be appropriate, but, uh, and some people feed their pets once a day. Some people feed their pets randomly. Um, you know, some days it's twice, some days it's once. Uh, Emma Rutherford from England, she has a, a wonderful um, a holistic pet feeding site. She's great. I interviewed her uh, for one of my expos last year. And um, the way that she feeds her dogs, it's sort of a free choice thing. And it's something different all the time. She feeds them on planks. I think she has like 16 chihuahuas and she just puts these planks all around her kitchen and it's random when she decides to put them out. So some days they're fasting and some they're not. And it might have 20 different things laid out and each dog eats whatever they want. And she said, they balance it over time. I don't worry about it. Wow. Uh, really interesting way to feed. And I thought, well, I, it'd be a free for all at our house. And I said, you, you don't have any fighting with 16 dogs. And she said, no, they all just, they do their thing. So uh, you know, I don't think that there is a right way and a wrong way to feed our dogs. Um, well, there are a couple of wrong ways, but uh, you know, there, there is no one exact right way. Let's put it that way. Okay, perfect. Um, I think we've got a couple of people that have just come up. So I'll just um, activate the speakers. Um, all right. Hello, Anne. Hi there. Hi, Dr. Morgan. Hello. That's a cutie sitting with you. <laughs> this, this is Curly, and we've been in communication on Facebook about him. This is my picky eight-month-old cavalier, and we've got two cavaliers. One is an absolute chow hound, and this one's the picky one, and he all of a sudden turned picky. So hmm. what's going on? About six months old, we went on a road trip. He threw up. We were with family. We were living in a cabin. I think the new area might have stressed him out a little bit. He didn't seem to be stressed, but ever since that trip, he's been off food. So, you know, I've spent hundreds of dollars going through all provide, answer, small batch, trying different things, raw food, gently cooked, and he'll eat it for a few days, then he goes off. I've noticed a little bit of lip smacking. I've noticed nausea, not wanting to eat in the mornings. So we tried the gently cook. He seemed to do a little bit better on the gently cook versus the answers. Um, but we're still doing a little bit of the raw goat smoke sometimes when I can't get him to eat, even just you know syringing a couple of teaspoons in him and then it stimulates appetite. So what suggestions do you have? Is he just No, he actually has uh, inflammation down there. Um, he He's telling you okay. with his lip smacking and his unwillingness mm -hmm. to 
to be a chow hound because Cavaliers are chow hounds. He's telling you it hurts. Uh, there is something that is causing problems for this guy. Um, so he might be somebody that we should look at adding an herb. I, so he's a youngster. Is he high energy? Cause he looks pretty laid back. Oh no, he loves to play. He's very athletic. We started gut soothe about a month okay. ago from adored beast. Find okay. that it helps a little bit, but then again, it's not completely okay. helpful. Um, we're doing good probiotics, ones that have prebiotics, probiotics, and a IGY okay. in there. That seems okay. to help a little bit, but never fully resolving. He also had Ugh. Giardia as a puppy, so I'm I'm pretty sure yep. that yeah, that that's what um, sets you off to thing. begin with. And there is uh, one school of thought that says you never get rid of Giardia; it just goes kind of into hiding. Uh, so it may still be there, causing some inflammation. Um, uh, so you said he doesn't, th does he eat at night better than the morning? Yeah. Yes, okay. he does. He needs his stomach warmed. Have you, uh, put him on, uh, ginger tea? So I would, uh, syringe, gin just make a cup of ginger tea, uh, syringe that in the morning okay. to warm up his gut. Uh, because the fact that he's not eating okay. in the morning, he's waiting till he kind of warms up and gets going and his guts are moving a little better. Um, you might want to give him a little ginger tea before bed at night too, and see if that helps. Uh, what proteins are you feeding him? Currently he is on, I'll provide okay. gently cooked turkey. We tried the beef and I noticed more unwillingness to eat because of the yep. beef. So we stopped okay. that completely. We've tried uh, pork. We've tried duck. He was in his stage okay. of not wanting to eat. We did a freeze dried prey diet to see if, you know, he did the rabbit for a while. Um, he was okay for about two weeks and then same thing okay. again. Didn't yeah. So eat. we've still got some gut inflammation going on down there. He's a dog who wants to be an IBD dog and we don't want him to. So uh, you, yeah. um, have you tried a whitefish diet? He won't touch, we'll the, touch cod. the cod. I poached we'll a cod her. the other day. Okay. All right. Stick with things yeah. that are more cooling. Beef is probably too heavy for him. Try the ginger tea morning and night. And let's see if that helps him. If not, we may have to go to a warming herb, something like stomach happy. I'm a happy. Okay. All right. Do I continue with the gut soothe or stop that completely and do just ginger tea? And it says specific. A couple teaspoons is fine. Uh, I think the gut soothe is okay to keep going. Okay. And probiotics and goat milk. Do we keep doing that? One or the other. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. I've got Piper's tree. <laughs> I have a bunch of dachshunds, and um, I, 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 I can't hear. Oh no! I don't know how to fix this. Can you hear me? Uh, okay, I think you just need it a little closer to you, but I, I, we'll try. Can you hear me there now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Judy. I have uh, a bunch of dachshunds. And I do have a long hair chihuahua who's 12 years old and she has um, a liver issue, a high protein in the kidney, high protein urine issue and um, pyloric valve issue that we're trying to get checked out. My question is, um, I also have a dachshund that has a high ALT and nothing else is wrong with them. And another dachshund that has, all of a sudden she has two seizures and she's on Keppra, but doing well, knock on wood. Can I do the regular pup loaf for everybody across the board? I think you can. For the dog with high liver enzymes and the seizure dog, because seizures are commonly related to uh, wind coming from the liver, internal wind, could be a liver blood deficiency. What are they eating now? Um, your pup loaf. Okay. Um, I have on Purina, can't, no kibble whatsoever, but Purina Pro Plan weight management, believe it or not. And I cook, along with that, I was cooking uh, broiled chicken or ground turkey or ground beef and um, green beans. And so I, I make just, my own. 
I would go just to the pup loaf and get rid of the canned food if at all possible, because That's if there I mean. are, yeah, if there's grains in the food, uh, if there's any aflatoxins, which are the mold toxins in the grains in the canned food, uh, that could be increasing liver enzymes. We see that very commonly. So I would just kind of let that go by the wayside. But what I would recommend doing is we want to make your pup loaf a little more liver draining. Hi, kids. That's a cool this color. I L two boy. <laughs> okay, so if you can get either dandelion greens or milk thistle, something like that, to add into your pup loaf as part of the greens, that would be they're excellent. On milk, they're on milk thistle daily drops. Good. Okay, so if you can get dandelion greens and asparagus as part of the greens in your pup loaf, that's that drains the liver. And leave all the other greens in because I'm using kale yeah. and char. Okay. Yeah. So if you're using, I don't know what, I don't remember what the percentages are, but if you're using like eight ounces of greens, just make sure that part of that is dandelion greens and asparagus. Oh, okay. 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 So everybody can have the same thing. God yeah. bless you. <laughs> I was going Does make it easier. Oh, I know. Well, it took six hours to grind everything the other night because I tripled the loaf, let me tell you. But they love it. So thank you, Dr. Judy. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Take care. Um, that's, um, sorry, we seem to have lost you there at the end. Um, I'm just trying to connect Kan Chan. I don't know if she can get through or he can get through. Um, I do have a question from Kerry. Um, she sent that um, close to the beginning of the session. She says, do you recommend decreasing protein levels and increasing veggies as dogs get into their senior years? or keeping proteins and veggie levels the same for senior dogs? So if we're talking about something like my pup loaf, I don't change it for seniors unless we are in advanced stages of kidney disease. So if we're in, uh, so kidney disease, they stage one through four. If you're in three or four, we might start lowering the protein a little bit. Uh, but senior dogs actually need more protein because they have more muscle wasting. They're generally losing more protein in their, um, in their bowel and in their kidneys. And we need to replace it. If we don't replace that and we restrict protein from these guys, we end up with muscle atrophy or muscle wasting. And that's what we don't want because then we have weakness and they can't, they can't be mobile. So I do not restrict it. Uh, we had a 16 year old cocker with stage two chronic kidney disease. She stayed on the same level, same raw food, uh, say, at, at raw or cooked, whichever, uh, same protein levels. I never changed it. And she was absolutely fine, stayed at the same level. So uh, I will only change it if I've got a dog whose BUN and creatinine are really starting to escalate. We can't control them and we need to start bringing that down or we need to control phosphorus levels. So I don't change them unless we have really significant reasons to start bringing it down. Okay, perfect. I hope that answers your question, okay. Carrie. Yeah, she says thank you very much. Um, okay, we've got Kanchan. Um, I'll just let Hi, you Dr. take Judy. over. Uh, Hello. Uh, Kanchan, and then this is uh, Ronnie right here with me. Um, he's a one and a half year old Cavalier. Um, I've been following you. We actually recently switched Ronnie over from uh, kibble to raw diet and um, eating uh, canine right now. Um, but I am finding that he's a little bit um fussy because there are times where he will approach the food and he will gobble and eat it up and then there are moments where we kind of have to you know push him and he'll nibble a little um but then he kind of gets off of it um and then i have been noticing like the last couple of you know last couple of days now i think it's been four days where um you know he has been his tools have been a little um, a little bit more on the mushy end. So I'm not sure if that's happening more so because of the, the change in diet or is that, um, you know, just sort of on and off with what's been going on with him from uh, because of the, of the food switch. How um, long ago did you make the switch? The switch has been, I mean, it's been a month now, but I have been noticing like some, he, the, in addition to the canine, prior to doing canine, we were raw feed, we were doing the, freeze dried um um we were using primal and we were doing the freeze uh freeze dried meals so he started on the freeze dried and then we switched to the canine um you know like they have like the packages that have you don't have to add anything um you just give it the whole meal 
Um, but I am seeing that when I give him K9, the pure roar, he sometimes will be at it. And then if he's not eating that, then I go back to the freeze dried. Um, and then he does eat that. So I don't know if it's because we're switching back and forth between the freeze and the actual raw. Um, is that sort of throwing his stomach off? Uh, it may be that that new one doesn't agree with him. Um, so you may need to try a different brand. Okay. Um, we do have some dogs that love freeze dried, and my cats, they love freeze dried, but don't love raw, okay. the frozen, like the frozen raw. Yeah. For some of them, it's a consistency thing. For some of them, it, it I mean, it, 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 it's a different taste. Um, and I, even my dogs who are, have been raw fed forever, uh, every once in a while, they'll go off and say, I am not eating that frozen raw and they will, but they'll dive in to the freeze dried and it's definitely a different texture. Um, and I, I don't know why they do it. I, I really don't know why, uh, my choice would be that they are eating a raw product that hasn't been freeze dried because it's less processed, but sometimes it just doesn't agree with them as well. So I would consider trying because this not the backing off of eating is I've got a little bit of a belly ache. I'm not sure today. So think about it. You wake up in the morning, you're semi nauseous. You're like, eh, I'll wait till later and see if I feel better. Um, so, and we don't want that. They, they should always be pretty eager. Some dogs aren't really food motivated, but they should be pretty eager to eat their food if it's agreeing with them. So if you've been making this change recently and we were okay on freeze dried in the days that he doesn't want the raw, but he'll eat the freeze dried. I mean, that kind of tells you something right there. Either it's a texture thing or it's the different protein. Uh, but I would consider before I would write off the, uh, the, frozen raw or fresh raw, whichever it is, before I'd write it off, I would try another brand and see okay. if it's the texture itself or if it's just that particular brand. Maybe it doesn't have as much bone. Maybe it's got more organ. They're, they're all a little bit different. Uh, some of them are prey model. Some of them are not prey model. And each dog is going to have a preference. Um, okay. And uh, dogs generally, they'll have a preference, but they'll eat. But if they've got any gut pain, anything that's not agreeing, they've got a little bit of reflux going on down there, they're going to back off. And okay. we should, we should honor that and say, eh, that's not agreeing with you. Let's, let's try a different road. Okay. And, right? and suggestion on goat milk that we took up and he loves that. He, I, if he could drink okay. goat milk all day long, I, he'd do it. <laughs> well, it's a complete diet. You just have to give him a lot of it, but they can't live on it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Lindy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I have a a cross on Julia, Ralph. Oh, sorry, yes, I'm on. Okay. Sorry, Ralph. <laughs> um, and I was interested because the last lady that came on with a spaniel, and you said about the warming the stomach up. He's um, I'm currently transitioning him onto a raw diet. He's on pork at the moment, but he's been like this a while. Here he is. <laughs> um, he won't eat in the morning sometimes um, and you can see he feels a bit nauseous he prefers to eat in the evening but he's a really hot dog he's always really hot and he seeks we have a cool mat in every room and he, he always he, he always has wanted to be cool all the time he doesn't like to sit on your lap a long time because it gets really hot how old is he? he's 18 months old okay I didn't know if adding the warmer, like the ginger tea, would that make him warmer or? Um... No, I would try it. Um, yeah. I would try it for a week or two and see if it helps because ginger is also really um, soothing for the gut. If the ginger tea doesn't help at all, I would switch to peppermint tea. Right. If the peppermint tea doesn't work at all, um, then I would either change proteins in his diet. Uh, and, you know, if dogs don't have to eat twice a day. And we yeah, do no, have... We've, we've gone to once at the moment. We've put yeah, and if he wants day. to eat later in the day and eat yeah. once, that's not a problem. So, yeah, but try, try the tea. Um, I just want... I just wasn't sure of the connection between warming food and him feeling warm. Do you understand me? 
Yeah, oh, I mean, I would still. That, or is there a... Yeah, I would still try to stick with the more cooling foods for him. And pork is a, a pretty good choice. He was on duck before, and now he's on pork. Um, I'm due to change to a, pro a different protein this week to try. Okay. To, we're doing an elimination diet, so should have okay. stick with a, a more cooling protein. Good. Um, yes. Yeah. I, yeah. So I would try rabbit or duck. Right. I've not always had duck before, but okay. I haven't seen any difference in him in terms of how hot he seems to feel like. No, yeah. Cool um, well, part of what you're fighting is he's an 18 month old kind of hyperactive breed. So yeah. that's just his constitution right now is he's going to be energetic just because he's 18 months old. I mean, we do have some breeds that at 18 months old are couch potatoes, um, but most of them are not. So they're, they're going to be energetically hot just because of age and size of dog. Um, but that doesn't mean that internally they're that hot. So right. what are the stools like in this dog? Um, now that on the raw, they're a lot better. He had colitis for quite a few months, hence why I, 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 um, I'm working with a, 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 a holistic vet on transferring him to a raw diet, and his stools have been a lot, lot better. Good. Um, just yeah. take it very, very slowly with him. Yeah, so colitis is a hot problem. Absolutely a hot problem. Going to be worse in the summer. Uh, so that's, you're, you're, you're going the right course with this guy with the cooling proteins. That's what you need to do. So I would try the ginger tea, see if that helps. Now he might be a dog that, uh, if the ginger doesn't work and the peppermint doesn't work, then I would go to slippery elm. Okay. Because right. slippery elm is a yin tonic. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you're welcome. Um, there was another question that we got from Stephen. Um, he said he's been feeding recipes from your book um, for his dog that has HSA cancer. Um, and that they've been monitoring the weight and find that he's keeping pretty steady, but it feels like they're feeding him a lot. Should they be um, promoting the weight gain um, or weight retention uh, or keeping more volume? Or is it good if, is it good if she's... Um, gained some weight um what's your take on that so it kind of depends on where she started if the dog was really thin and needed to put on a little weight then fine uh we do want to keep our cancer dogs fairly thin uh we want them on the lean side of normal so if you look at one of the body condition scores the bcs uh purina actually even though i'm not a fan of purina they make a really nice body condition score that you can find online and it goes from one to nine and most Americans keep their dogs at a five, six, or seven. We'd like these particularly dogs with cancer to be more of a four. Uh, so we want to see a tucked waist. Um, and a lot of times, particularly with these cancer diets, uh, because there's no carbs, the volume may look very big of the amount of food that you're feeding. And a lot of times we find that we need, they actually can eat more calories than what they would eat on, say, a, a processed kibble product, because it's it's not all that starch that's laying there like a lump. Um, so these guys, their metabolism can be revved up a little bit, and we kind of want that. So uh, you're gonna feed um, you're gonna feed them to maintain whatever weight you think is ideal. So if you look at that body condition score, look at what a four looks like, and that's about where we want to keep, particularly cancer dogs. Um, obesity, I think I said this in a different lecture today. Obesity is an inflammatory disease. It is not just it's a cute fat dog or a cute fat cat. It is an inflammatory disease. Fat cells put out hormones and enzymes that are pro-inflammatory and they increase inflammation throughout the entire body. So a lot of times animals who are overweight have osteoarthritis and we, and we will justify that and say, well, he's carrying around an extra 20% of body weight. That's more pressure on the joints. Therefore he's going to develop arthritis. No, he's going to develop arthritis because he's putting out all these inflammatory mediators from all those fat cells and all, those, all that inflammation causes pancreatitis, which eventually will make the pancreas poop out and, and you get diabetes because they can no longer make insulin. We get osteoarthritis, which is an inflammatory disease. We can get more heart disease that's inflammatory. So 
keeping our dogs lean, and particularly a cancer dog, which is an inflammatory process, keeping them lean is going to help fight that inflammation. Okay, um, we've got Lynn. Um, let's see if we can get Lynn through. Um, have a look. Um, she's managing to come through. No. Okay, in the meantime, let's just see if she does manage to get through. So, Lynn, just try and accept the permissions um, to allow access to your camera and also your audio. Um, and we'll, we'll see if we can get you on. There is another question. This was from Mark. He said, how should um, they transition to cook to a cooked diet? Is there a time frame and are there any precautions that he should take? Oh, what an interesting question. So I do a ton of rescue work and we have had many fosters go through our house and um, I don't own kibble. I and if they come with kibble, I throw it away. It does not, it literally does not cross the, the threshold. Um, so I always do a quick change. Now, do I sometimes get a little bit of a stool change? Yes. Uh, I get dogs who don't recognize cooked or raw food as food because it's not a crunchy, hard, round thing in the bowl. And they literally will walk away and you have to hand feed and put the first mouthful in there for them to figure out that that's something they're even supposed to eat. Kind of blows me away. For most people who, you know, if, if, if a dog gets diarrhea in my house, I can deal with it. It's not an issue. <laughs> but for the client who says, well, I want to change my dog and I don't want to end up at the emergency service at two o'clock in the morning on Sunday, um, doing a slow transition is probably better. Uh, it takes two to three days for the gut microbiome, which is all the bacteria in the gut, the good guys and the bad guys, it takes two to three days for them to transition anytime we make a change in the diet. So having starting a probiotic uh, at the time that you want to start changing the meal is a good idea because we're already starting to seed the gut with what we want it to have. So find a good prebiotic, probiotic product that you can go ahead and start them on. And if you're feeding a kibble that says it has probiotics added, forget it. They're useless. Uh, add one. So you could start that first and then cook something that doesn't have 7,000 ingredients in it and make it very low fat. So cook lean meats to start and start using it as a topper on your kibble. Remember to take some kibble out when you start putting that in as a topper, because we don't want to just double the calories. So take out an, a, an approximate equivalent portion and for a lot of people, if you have a dog that has a lot of inflammatory bowel disease problems or they've had a lot of issues anytime you've given them table food or something different, then do a slow transition. Feed 25% of the new food and 75% of the old food for a week, then go 50-50, then go 75-25. And then in the fourth week, you would be all the way over. I've never done it that slowly in my entire life with any dog. Uh, but there are the occasional dogs that we have to do that. But if you start with things that are very lean and you start with minimal ingredients for your topper. Um, and if you have a dog that has a history of inflammatory bowel disease, do not start with chicken or beef as your add-in because those are the two most problematic proteins that I have found in my practice. Uh, it's really interesting if you talk to uh, a veterinary dermatologist, they'll tell you beef is more problematic. If you talk to me in my practice, I can tell you chicken is way above as a problem. Um, but we do, and part of that is because chicken's a hot protein. So if you have a dog with an inflammatory problem, we don't want to head that way. And uh, when you do introduce chicken, I would go with dark meat skinless to start because we want to decrease the fats a little bit when we're, when we're adding that on. Um, and if you include some nice fibrous vegetables, a little bit of cooked kale, uh, green beans, asparagus, something like that, when you start out as well, that's going to increase the bulk a little bit and decrease the chances of diarrhea. Okay. Um, I think there are some more coming through here. I do have one more. Um, someone was asking about um, how can you tell the difference if it's reflux versus nausea? Apparently her puppy often, um, especially in the morning, um, has a poor appetite and she's noticed that she's either vomiting or there's reflux. It's the same thing. It's just, okay. it's just the reflux is it gets up and goes back down. 
uh, the vomiting is it gets all the way up. <laughs> so, uh, but that's a, that's a dog who is having a problem with the food they're being fed. Uh, something is not agreeing when you're getting that kind of reflux. Almost all puppy foods are chicken based. I, and so the first thing we do is move away from chicken. Um, it's hard to find puppy foods without chicken in it, but, uh, and it's hard to find a limited ingredient diet, uh, particularly for young growing puppies. But I would say, let's switch that dog to a completely different protein. And if you're, if you're feeding a kibble, um, and you need to stick with a kibble for whatever reason, um, you can still find a kibble that doesn't have you, know, you can still change protein. So my office manager years ago, when we first started with all this, she had a beagle puppy that was just a crazed maniac, unable to house train it. It, it was hyper hot, you know, couldn't learn anything. And it was on a chicken based kibble. And I just looked at her, I said, Pam, it was a beagle. I said, Pam, why don't you change that dog to a more cooling protein and let's see what happens. So all she did was move from within the same uh, company brand, went from a chicken based kibble to a beef based kibble with no chicken in it. And within three weeks, the dog could learn commands. It was house trained and it wasn't a crazed maniac because we cooled it down. So even within whatever brand or type of food that you're feeding, if you can't do uh, you know, a huge shift, just changing from cooling to warming or warming to cooling can make a huge difference for these guys. It's not an overnight thing, uh, but I get emails all the time from people that say, wow, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, you know, I emailed you and said my dog had X, Y, or Z, whether it was a change in nose color, a change in uh, urinary patterns, a change in panting, um, whatever, uh, attitude. Mm -hmm. We do a diet change. Three to four weeks later, I get an email that says, wow, look, the nose changed color. Look, the drinking got back under control. Look, the liver enzymes came down. So there's a lot that you can do with food. Um, and sometimes it doesn't have to be a major shift. Sometimes we have to, you know, totally change things around depending on how bad they are. But if you have an animal with inflammatory bowel disease that has, you know, diarrhea all the time, has blood and mucus in the stools all the time, why would you feed what you're feeding today again tomorrow? It's not working. Yeah. So you needed to make a change. Yeah. Um, I also had another question. Um, someone said they transitioned to a raw food diet, but their dog constantly had diarrhea. So they reverted back to kibble. What yeah. should they do? So uh, again, I look at the protein. It's really, yeah. I think it's weird when dogs, and also uh, make sure you're using a, a high quality company and maybe switch to a different high quality company uh, because mm -hmm. raw foods are very different in uh, the bone content. Most dogs get constipated, if anything, when we switch to raw because of the bone content in there. But not all companies have the same amount of bone content. And depending on what country you're in, that can be different. Ian Billinghurst, who's a, mm -hmm. the original barf veterinarian in Australia, yeah. that, that we in America do not put near enough bone in our diets. He feeds a much higher bone content than we do. Mm -hmm. And the higher the bone content, generally, the more firm the stool. Something I've been adding into my dog's food recently, um, because I've been kind of blending a lot of my own things is ground chicken feet. And let me tell you, you put ground chicken feet in the diet, you get nice firm stools. Now, if you have a dog who has a chicken allergy, that's not going to work. But for my guys, I add ground chicken feet in there and man, I've got these beautiful white dusty stools that I love. <laughs> <laughs> They're so easy to pick up. <laughs> so if it's not agreeing with your dog, I would do a more gradual transition and I would try something different, either a different company, a different protein, look at the bone content, look at the fat content. You might need to go with a company that has a lower fat content or a protein that is a lower fat content um, than what you tried to start with. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm just trying to check if there's any more. There's a question from Carolyn Duff. Um, she says, is there a way to treat a mast cell tumor using diet to help heal it? Um, it has broken open and we're using green tea bags topically and Cara Care with CBD. So CBD is going to be great for that uh, topically. Um, they're actually, I think I saw that you guys are up in Vermont or somewhere. Um, you want to use things that are going to resolve stagnation. Um, there is a, an herbal product called Neoplasine. 
Um, Bloodroot is the other name for it. It's made by Buck Mountain Herbs. If you could, if you have a holistic veterinarian near you that might be willing to use it, it's actually an herb that eats cancer and you can apply it topically. And uh, it generally takes about seven days and the tumor falls off. Um, we've used it successfully on a lot of mammary tumors for animals that uh, were unable to undergo anesthesia. I used it on a, a really huge um, liposarcoma, which is a lipoma that's a cancer instead of the benign type. It was up under the dog's armpit uh, and we injected it right up in there and the whole thing drained out and never came back. Uh, so if you could find neoplasin, that might be an option. Um, and as far as foods for that, absolutely things that are cooling, and you might even try a keto. Uh, and if you go to ketopet.org, recipes are right there. Uh, so you just put in the weight of your dog and it'll kick out a recipe for you and it gives you uh, different options for different proteins as well. Uh, so that might be something to consider along with it. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks very much, Judy. I think we've come to the end of the session now. Thank you so much, Judy Morgan. Um, yeah, it's it's always amazing watching her. I don't know how many of you have seen her live on Facebook. Um, thanks so much for coming in and delivering this session. No problem. Um, <laughs> look, I hope to see you soon again. All right. Thanks, Judy. Bye-bye.